everyone. Uh, my name is Ishaq Patan. I'm the Bay Area Director at Islamic Networks Group, or ING. Uh, we are based uh, out in California, and we do work on peace building through education and interfaith engagement. We are a grass, we're, we're US based, we're a grassroots peacemaking organization. And as I mentioned earlier, we're really dedicated to face to face education and engagement to foster understanding of Muslims and other misunderstood groups to promote harmony among all people. Uh, our founder is Maha Al Janadi. She was a Muslim American and she founded ING um, over, you know, around 28 years ago uh, by focusing on educating Americans about Islam and Muslims, especially during the time of the Persian Gulf, the first Persian Gulf War, where there was a lot of misinformation. Over time, uh, I'd say that our organization's mission has broadened uh, to include groups that include uh, other misunderstood groups from other world religions, as well as other races and ethnicities. How does this play out in terms of our work? Uh, what it really entails is that when looking at social science studies, face-to-face uh, -face engagement with members of misunderstood minority groups has significant impact to improve biases against them in as little as 10 minutes. And so our work is primarily done through presentations and panels uh, with either Muslims or diverse sets of uh, people from world religions, including Islam, Christianity, Hinduism, or Buddhism, or diverse panels that focus on, um, are focused on bigotry through an intercultural framework featuring panelists from those world religions, as well as from, you know, uh, ethnicities and races, including African-American, Asian-American, Latinx, indigenous, Amer uh, indigenous peoples, and so on. And so a lot of the work that we do is in schools, uh, where we uh, deliver presentations and panels to supplement world history and ethnic studies curriculum, uh, but also education elsewhere uh, in um, houses of worship and community centers and things like that as well as cultural diversity seminars and trainings with various public agencies in the, throughout the United States, including law enforcement agencies, uh, healthcare offices, um, educators in public schools and administrators in public schools and private schools, uh, as well as um, corporations. Yeah, when we talk about pursuing peace, what we're really emphasizing is this idea of, of continued engagement uh, with groups. Uh, I think that is a strong value that we hold, that we, we want, you know, drawing from teachings of the Quran, of the Prophet Muhammad, and, and, other, and as well as others, is that everyone, you know, human beings are good, uh, that they, um, they have the ability to, you know, counter whatever is not good within them and overcome it. Uh, and, and it's important for us to see that in everyone. Uh, another element of our work is engaged with young Muslims, uh, where we work with Muslim teenagers to really address bullying that they face. Muslim teens uh, experience bullying at double the rate of the national average at around 50%. And we work with their, with them as well as their parents to provide, uh, to, in, to build up their confidence and enable them to articulate their identity in meaningful ways uh, to their classmates and peers. Uh, unfortunately, Muslims have a decently bad rep. Uh, studies show, there was a 2019 YouGov poll. It showed that only 15% of Americans have a favorable view of Islam. Um, most of the, you know, out of that 85%, most are unsure or have a negative opinion of the religion, which is fascinating given that it is so similar to Christianity and Judaism, which are you know, prominent religions in the United States. Um, and, and Muslims themselves, uh, in certain studies, about half of Muslims over the last year have reported experiencing some form of discrimination, usually in, um, in terms of, usually verbally where people are kind of identifying them as terrorists. As an example, when I was growing up, uh, I, um, my, I had moved from New York over to Connecticut and right before seventh grade. And I was this new student. And there's obviously tons of challenges that a student has when he's new. Uh, but added to those challenges were the level of comments that I got from 
peers and classmates about me being a terrorist. I one student on the bus had mentioned, you know, I thought you were this uh, this Muslim terrorist who was going to blow up our school. Uh, this is on the bus on the way to school. Uh, so, um, and there's other comments like that. And, and this is common amongst, you know, my friends that are Muslim now, everyone has stories about these things. And that's, that's part of the reason why I think the work that we do at ING is so valuable, because it's really aiming to, you know, address this misinformation, the rampant Islamophobia, anti-Islam bigotry, and cut it at its root. Because, uh, you know, we see at the forefront hate crimes against Muslims, but underlying those hate crimes are attitudes and beliefs and perceptions and the common, the common uh, comment that someone will make, you know, in, in the cafeteria, in the library, or on the street, at the grocery store. And we're really trying to address that. When thinking about the United States over the last, you know, few years, I, I actually started at the organization uh, in 2016, and the election was about, you know, five months into me working here. And so most of my work has been under uh, the, the Trump administration and now moving into the, the Biden administration. And unfortunately, what we saw uh, between 2015 and 2016, so it was actually that election year right up to the election, uh, the number of hate crimes, uh, the number of hate groups, anti-Muslim hate groups documented by the Southern Poverty Law Center went from around 30 to around 100, uh, almost, you know, tripled uh, in this time. Uh, and that is unfortunately what we have been dealing with over the last, uh, you know, few years. That number has thankfully dwindled a little bit, but there are Muslim organizations, including our Muslim-founded based organizations working on Islamophobia, including our own, tackling this issue from all angles because it's so widespread. Uh, Islamophobia has, is, is not only something that exists between individuals, but it's a rampant multi-million, hundreds of million dollar industry uh, of individuals that push out negative information about Muslims and Islam and, and at the same time exhibit other views against other groups, anti-Semitic views, uh, racist views, uh, xenophobic views, and so on. And so that has, that has led us to have to kind of grapple with this, but also come to new realizations. And so in the process of that, what we realized was that Islamophobia is firmly rooted in these other forms of bigotry. It's like, you know, Islamophobia is directly tied with anti-Semitism in the United States, as it is tied with anti-Blackness. So, um, and so that's led us to one of our newest programs, which basically basically aims to pull together panelists from these diverse communities to examine the history of bigotry and where it comes from, that what we're experiencing now in 2021 has been with us for the last hundred, you know, few hundred years and, and now manifests in various ways, both on an individual and systemic basis in our communities. One of the reasons we actually started the Interfaith Speakers Bureau, which was moving beyond education about Muslims to education about Muslims alongside Christians, Jews, Buddhists, and Hindus, was to number one, it was because of a need that we recognized that, you know, the, the, the level of religious education, that it, uh, education about religion is not religious education, uh, has, is very low. The literacy that people have about any religion is not... Um, is not like at a high level. And so that has led us to, to say that if you want to learn about Islam, you need to know about Christianity, about Judaism and others. And that has kind of built up those solidarity efforts. And so while we may not have, and there are Christians of all kinds that volunteer with our organization, uh, moving from evangelical to Episcopalian uh, to Catholic and so on. And that has, you know, that level of solidarity and is is really important as we as we move forward because you know religions and and people of faith of different backgrounds have a lot in common and that comes very through uh, during these panels we have a panel on shared values and people see the the ways in which one value is very in Islam is very similar to a value in Christianity or Judaism or Hinduism and um, 
And so I think really it's, we may not have every person of faith on our side, uh, but we, we, we take solace in the idea of working together with all different groups of people uh, to push forward a notion of peace. And the reality is that there are going to be Muslims that are focused and fixated on their narrow perception of Islam. There are going to be Buddhists. There are going to be Christians, Jews, Hindus, all groups. And we're seeing that across the world. We're seeing narrow-minded interpretations of religion everywhere, uh, in the United States, in India, in China, uh, Israel, everywhere, really. And so it's just a matter of those working towards peace, uh, being willing to work together over those shared values to move forward. And amongst Muslims, no, thankfully not. I mean, again, there is strong diversity amongst Muslims in the United States, and you see that diversity manifesting in how Muslims practice their faith, but also how they um, how they address Islamophobia. Even you know, like we have many Muslim-founded organizations that are working on against Islamophobia, whether it's providing media representation for Muslims, whether it's countering um, discrimination in the form of civil rights, whether it's working um, to establish Muslims on a political sphere, whether it's ING working for education, whether it's providing research. And the fortunate aspect is that all of these organizations are, you know, strategies may be different, but we're all, we all have similar goals, uh, which is to move, move forward. I personally think the biggest misconception is kind of what we've touched on already is the monolithic no nature of Islam and Muslims. If you get rid of this notion that 1.8 billion Muslims are the same, then you inevitably will get rid of all the other stereotypes that exist because you're no longer associating all Muslims with being terrorists, which would be the case of a few. You're no longer associating all Muslims with being oppressive of women or, um, or anything else because you've, you've recognized that Muslims are just as complex, are made up of multiple identities uh, that affect and in, uh, that impact their behavior. And I think that is single-handedly the most important thing. And I think that our organization is really um, dedicated to, to providing that nuance surrounding Muslims and Islam and other world religions as well. It doesn't just end with Muslims. Um, so that people are not looking at Muslims as terrorists. To be honest, they're also not looking at Muslims as victims. You know, we're not a group of victims in the United States looking for help from everyone. We have a lot to contribute. And we have a history of contributing with African-American history of Muslims in the United States, you know, going back uh, hundreds of years uh, to the present day. I think, you know, there, I think it's about listening to members of, listening to, to members of a particular group and taking their word for it because they experience and they know what they're talking about. That doesn't mean like, um, they're not experts, but they, but, but every, every member of a particular group can speak to the lived experience of what it's like to be a member of that group and can speak to the lived experience of, of, of discrimination against that group as well. And unfortunately, there are numerous instances in which, you know, you have a group that's saying this is a problem, uh, but no one listens to them because they don't acknowledge their perspectives. They don't validate their perspectives. And I think that is something that allies have been and, and, and should continue to do uh, is to, to listen to voices when, you know, in our panel, which is focused on that intercultural element of, of tackling Islamophobia, anti-Semitism, and so on, a huge way in which these, these, um, this bigotry that we experience had, was created was the redefinition and silencing of narratives, where groups around the world were no longer defining themselves. They were letting, in, that, in those specific instances, they were letting you know, very specific Europeans define them. Nowadays, uh, Obviously, that's not happening, but we're, we're still seeing everyone define one another as opposed to letting people define themselves. And that's on an individual basis where each, each individual should, should feel empowered to articulate their own identity to one another. And I think it's on a group basis as well, where you have groups 
from all different backgrounds, whether it's sexual orientation, whether it's religion, race, gender, being able to speak for themselves, to talk for themselves rather than have others, uh, others do that.